Hello, everyone. Welcome to the American Pharmacists Association three-part podcast series on point with pneumococcal vaccines. What's new in 2022? Supported by an unrestricted grant from Pfizer. My name is John Grabenstein. I'm a pharmacist on Maryland's Eastern Shore, and I serve as Director of Scientific Communication for Immunize.org. I'll be your host for this series of podcasts with the latest updates on pneumococcal vaccines for adults. This is the third episode of a series of three podcasts. Please check out the first two episodes in the series uh, for our review of pneumococcal disease and vaccines to prevent it. The first episode explained how this is definitely a disease worth preventing because of its severity. Yet tens of millions of U.S. adults are vulnerable and probably don't realize it. The second episode described licensed pneumococcal vaccines and the recently revised ACIP recommendations for for their use. Let's focus now on getting barriers to vaccination out of the way and encouraging vaccine acceptance. I'm pleased to introduce James Wheeler, Associate Professor of Clinical Pharmacy and Translational Science at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. We will be discussing what can busy pharmacists do to keep their patients from contracting serious infections. So welcome, James. Glad to have you here to help us with these questions. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. To start, James, tell us how you got involved with vaccination. Sure. So at the University of Tennessee, I direct our continuing education program. And so we are charged with keeping healthcare providers up to date with with a variety of therapeutic issues, including vaccine schedules. Um, In addition, I also coordinate our um, APHA-based immunization delivery training certificate program. Uh, Last year, we trained over 100 pharmacists and technicians in vaccine administration. And that's in addition to our first-year students uh, that we train every year uh, to help Uh, vaccinate the country. James, as I said, we want to focus on getting barriers to vaccination out of the way. Um, So what are some of the primary barriers that keep adults from getting vaccinated, especially vaccinated against pneumococcal disease? Yeah, I I think the largest barrier is if if nobody suggests it, if nobody recommends it, or told patients that they're vulnerable, you know, they just are unaware. Um, and so th- the biggest issue is really working with patients to make them aware and, and doing screening. Um, we know that if we think about pharmacies, uh, there are a number of factors that can facilitate community pharmacy screening programs. If we think about the proximity in communities, uh, convenient access, um, hours that include evenings and weekends, all of those factors can help, communi- uh, can help facilitate community pharmacy screening programs. Um, In terms of other barriers, um, cost can be an issue for patients. Uh, We do know that Medicare Part B covers uh, seniors and and other Medicare enrollees um, who who need coverage for these vaccines. Uh, But for younger adults who would qualify, commercial insurance can can sometimes be a a barrier or Medicaid. Um, In addition, we also know that about 9% of the population is uninsured by some estimates. And so one barrier could potentially be um, out-of-pocket cost for vaccines. When I think about other barriers, um, select patients may have concerns about side effects. And so this is something clearly a pharmacist can work one-on-one with patients on. Uh, Many patients also have a fear of having an adverse reaction. Select patients may have a fear of needles, um, and then others may have concerns about combining vaccines, uh, such as maybe with their annual flu shot, even though uh, per the CDC schedule, that is... uh, perfectly allowable. Some patients may feel unlikely they will develop pneumonia or they don't know they're at risk. So again, that's why uh, screening patients and developing relationships is so important. Um, Another barrier could potentially be looking at things like uh, finding time to go to the physician office or the pharmacy, particularly if there's a series involved, if they have to come back for a second dose. And then finally, there can be some patient confusion. We found that with a number of changes in in the CDC schedule, um, and a number of products available on the market, patients may be confused about which vaccine product they've had in the past or what they should be getting. I'm really glad that you brought up that point about nobody suggested it. Uh, and that's you know so obvious that the pharmacist can, can play that important role of, uh, of, of making the vaccine offer, making the, the vaccine value clear to people. You know, we, we found a bunch of vaccine hesitancy with COVID-19 vaccines in the last couple of years. 
How has that affected patient confidence with pneumococcal vaccines? I think there's probably been some reports of that. I haven't seen that directly, um, but there's probably a group of patients who now have increased skepticism to vaccines, uh, and potentially that's due to misinformation. And so I do think it's important for pharmacists in particular to combat misinformation when possible. Uh, We've gone over uh, some of the resources that are available from either APHA or the CDC that are evidence-based. And so just remembering promoting uh, the evidence behind the vaccines is important, as well as working with patients one-on-one to answer their questions or concerns uh, when they come up about these vaccines. Good. That's, that's great. Yeah. So uh, you, you may have uh, be familiar with the Vaccine Confident uh, website that APHA created for the COVID-19 vaccination program. Obviously, it's focused on COVID-19 facts, but uh, the, the communication principles certainly apply to all vaccines. So uh, that would that's a resource we can we can uh, make a, uh, make available. Yeah, that's an excellent point, John. Let, let's talk about social determinants of health and and health disparities. What what's relevant in in that uh, frame in terms of adult pneumococcal vaccination? Yeah, I think there's several several barriers and several things we can do as as pharmacists to help uh, close those um, inequities. On the system level, sometimes fragmented medical records can be an issue or sometimes incomplete record reporting to the state vaccine databases, for example. Although I'm hopeful this is improving um, from our experience during the pandemic, as well as there have been interoperability guidelines for electronic health records. Uh, They've been released by CMS and others. And so we're hopeful that information sharing and uh, record reporting is improving across the country. Uh, we also know that healthcare providers can also experience competing priorities. Um, so pharmacies are busy places, and sometimes uh, vaccines, um, you know, are a competing priority with with a number of other uh, priorities that are that are happening in in the day to day operations of a pharmacy. One specific area that's a challenge can be pharmacy deserts um, or or healthcare deserts, um, where patients, um, if they are particularly in rural settings may not have an opportunity to just swing by the pharmacy. If the pharmacy is 20 or 30 minutes away, it requires basically a focused trip there. Um, and so uh, pharmacy deserts can be, can be um, a barrier and create disparities in some cases. And we are seeing increased rates of closure uh, in, in, in some rural communities. One opportunity for improvement for adverse patients is becoming aware of receiving the pneumococcal vaccine, and that's why education is so important. Uh, This is particularly a concern because of the increased rate of invasive pneumococcal disease in some minority groups. Uh, So, for example, uh, Black and Asian Americans in the 19 to 64 age group um, are less likely to be vaccinated compared to some of their peers. And and why is that important? It's because sub-observations are important to consider uh, when certain minority po- populations have a higher incidence of pneumococcal pneumonia and earlier onset of uh, related comorbidities. Um, and so screening programs, particularly in minority communities, uh, can really uh, play a huge role in combating health disparities. We also know that adults with chronic medical conditions can often receive uh, most of their care from a specialist. Uh, so maybe it's a cardiologist or an endocrinologist. Uh, because Uh, Vaccination is not usually part of everyday specialist practice. Uh, Practitioners may not be aware of the up-to-date recommendations such as presented in this podcast. These are all really important points. And, and, um, you know, it it, it falls to the pharmacist in a lot of cases to find the people that nobody else is paying attention to. And so it's a great service that uh, the pharmacist can provide in terms of vaccination. How about trust and knowledge between provider and patient? Or they're not, you know, you, they're, maybe they're not sick. <laughs> they're, they may just simply have an age that's uh, vaccinated. So the, the, the provider and the client, maybe. Yeah, I think it's huge here. Um, we know that from other studies that personal recommendations from either a physician or a pharmacist are the number one reason patients get vaccinated. So particularly patients that you interact with frequently, that relationship builds over time. And it's those patients that are most likely to get vaccinated ultimately. So developing those personal relationships on on patients that frequent your practice site on a regular basis can really be the targets for um, screening programs, making interventions for, for vaccine recommendations. 
yeah, messages from CDC are nice, but vaccinations are local. You can't <laughs> you can't vaccinate over the internet. Uh, it's got to be people you can touch, right? Uh, how about how about vaccine safety issues? What do we what do we need to be thinking about in terms of uh, vaccine safety here? Yeah, I, I think the bottom line is that the vaccines are safe, um, and so usually patients have many questions related to this. And the best thing I can encourage is is check out some of the patient education resources. Uh, the resources available from APHA or the CDC they have excellent patient care materials for explaining possible side effects or possible risks of vaccination. Um, but overall, you know, the risks are quite low and the benefits are quite great. So, uh, again, I think it's just speaking with patients individually, acknowledging their concerns and, and, uh, sharing some of the patient education literature that's out there. Okay. Let's shift over to workflow within a busy pharmacy and, and how you can organize your team. What strategies can you use to improve identification of people needing vaccination or counseling to expanding your pneumococcal vaccination program? What are what are key points to consider? Oh, that's a great question, John. I think it begins with training all staff to practice at the top of their license or registration. Um, incorporating students is another strategy. Um, you know, as an educator, we're always looking for opportunities for interns to get involved in vaccination programs um, that would gain them experience um, and allow to expand services in a busy pharmacy. Um, everyone on the team can have a role in in uh, identifying and counseling uh, patients for, for pneumococcal vaccination. Um, some organizational strategies uh, include um, instituting standing order programs. Um, if you have a collaborative practice agreement in a state that allows that, um, provider reminders in the electronic medical record are very useful, as well as patient outreach reminders um, have been shown to be beneficial. Um, in terms of pharmacy support staff, technicians, um, can also play a role uh, when it, things as simple as checking patients out at the cash register, identifying medications um, or conditions that would qualify patients uh, to have the pharmacist or intern come over and speak to the patient about opportunities for vaccination could be um, a, huge, a huge role and a huge asset for a pharmacy. Right. I mean, just having the, the techs and the clerks and the, and the other folks wear buttons is very passive uh, but, you know, uh, ask me about vaccination or uh, I got vaccinated and those sorts of things like I, got, I voted um, are, are important. And, and you know, the, the techs know when they have to go to the refrigerator to get out some insulin, uh, th those insulin users are people who need vaccine. Uh, so uh, that's another another cue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we previously covered in, in, in the other series um, who would qualify. But you're right. Uh, a lot of patients with comorbid conditions um, as well as older patients, um, qualify for pneumococcal vaccination. And so that's a, a large portion of any community pharmacy. Um, so you're right, looking for things like inhalers, um, like cardiac medications like digoxin, could trigger that conversation about um, getting vaccinated. Uh, when using a, a patient's profile review as part of the drug utilization review process, looking for opportunities to vaccinate patients, um, maybe looking at the patient portal for um, your your state's uh, immunization registry could be another way. Uh, one thing that I want to point out that often gets overlooked sometimes are smokers. Uh, smokers qualify for pneumococcal vaccination. And so for patients who are looking to quit, um, what better way to um, um, help help them in that journey by not only finding the appropriately appropriate smoking cessation, uh, products, but also working with them on, on vaccine opportunities. Yeah. I mean, it'll, you know, how long does it take to help somebody stop smoking? I mean, you're talking weeks anyway, and probably months, but how fast can you protect them against pneumococcal disease? One minute and, and you've got that protection to them. Absolutely. And, and we know it takes on average eight tries to quit smoking. And so there's likely many times uh, you won't be interacting with a patient, not just a single time. Um, and so with that, looking for opportunities in that patient population um, is, a, is another touch point. So let, let's talk about proactivity. I mean, people come in seeking flu vaccine, but people don't very often come in seeking pneumococcal vaccine. So, I mean, who, who should be doing what here? What's the pharmacist to do? What's the tech to, tech to do? 
Is it a, is it a matter of wait for them to ask for, for pneumococcal vaccine? I think that would be a mistake because a lot of patients, frankly, just don't know they need it. It's not on their radar. Um, nobody wants to get the flu. Nobody wants to get uh, pneumococcal disease either. Um, but but I would say that in terms of um, you know patient awareness, most everyone is aware of the flu. Probably not as many patients are aware, or maybe even few patients are aware of the consequences of invasive pneumococcal disease. Um, so we do have to be proactive here. Um, what are some ways we could do that? We've mentioned already training everybody on your team to practice at the top of their profession. Um, another thing could be if you have an informatics team um, as part of your support for your electronic health record, could alerts or screening tools be possible? Um, could that be built in? Uh, that will make uh, a busy community pharmacist job a little bit easier uh, to where they don't have to necessarily um, have a checklist for every prescription that comes through about should I be looking for this? If there's a way to automate some of this with technology, um, again, that would help uh, supplement uh time and effort among the pharmacy team. Good points. When I was in high school, I worked at Burger King one summer and um, we were trained that if somebody came in and asked for a hamburger, you're supposed to say, or a Whopper, I guess, uh, you're supposed to say, would you like cheese with that? And so I started, uh, as we were doing some of the early vaccination training programs, I would tell the pharmacist they need to, you know, somebody comes in and says, I'd like a flu shot. Your immediate response should be, would you like pneumococcal vaccine with that? Because the, the risk groups uh, overlap so much, not completely. Uh, anybody sh uh, can get a flu shot. Uh, the uh, indications for pneumococcal vaccination is a little bit uh, uh, narrower, uh, but, but it certainly is a good reflex to, uh, to develop. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's just looking for those opportunities and the, those present every day in pharmacies. So sometimes it's it's literally just seeing what's right in front of you. And that, you know, honestly, at the end of the day, that improves population health and improves the public health and is a great service to patients, which is what we're all here for. For sure. And in episode one, we talked about how pneumococcal disease strikes all 12 months of the year. I mean, influenza has a, the peak in the winter, uh, as we all know, but, uh, you know, you, you, sh you and you sort of turn on and turn off a, an influenza vaccination program, but um, the need it to offer uh, it, uh, pneumococcal vaccine, your, your pneumococcal vaccine in program in your pharmacy should be a 12 month a year program. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, James. Your contribution to the has been a great closing to this uh, three-part series. Thanks so much for so much useful information. If I can summarize our conversation so far, uh, there are new pneumococcal vaccines available. Uh, pneumococcal disease is serious and needs to be prevented whenever possible. Tens of millions of American adults are vulnerable to pneumococcal disease and could benefit from vaccination. Pharmacists and technicians are in a prime position to tap people on the shoulder and encourage them to roll up their sleeves and be vaccinated. I want to thank Pfizer for sponsoring this podcast, making it possible. I'd like to thank you, the listeners, for joining us. I hope you found it useful. Uh, and if you haven't heard them yet, listen to the other two episodes in the series. In episode one, we focus on pneumococcal disease severity and the risk factors for infection. And in episode two, we focus on the new pneumococcal vaccines and the policies for their use. A list of great references and resources accompanies this podcast in APHA's learning library. The list points you to helpful documents from the, from the CDC, from APHA, and from immunize.org. And for example, there's the CDC PneumoRex app uh, for smart devices uh, that uh, in just a few steps can help you customize the pneumococcal dosing decision for any given patient. Uh, any given client of yours. Lastly, keep an eye out for all the information coming out from APHA in terms of future events and, pro and podcasts. Again, thank you for joining us. For every pharmacist, for all of pharmacy, stay healthy and vaccinate all year round.